Hello everyone, this is the Insert Title Show and I'm your host, Wolf Strife. Uh, today is the 200th anniversary of the Battle of Lini and uh, Quatre Bas. And uh, the Battle of Lini was uh, Napoleon's last victory. It was, uh, let's see, Napoleon's Armée du Nord against uh, the Prussian Army led by Gebhard von Blücher. It was a pretty old guy. I think he was like in his 70s at the time of the battle, but he had been fighting since, you know, 1770s, I think. So he was a very, uh, very tough old bastard, and uh, he had fought Napoleon a number of times. So uh, he and Napoleon definitely had some history together. But uh, I guess I'll go into how this all came about. Uh, Napoleon was exiled to the island of Elba in 1814 after he abdicated the throne, basically after he had gambled all and lost all. But in, uh, I think it was late February, early March 1815, he escaped from the island of Elba and landed in, back in France. And uh, from there, he marched all the way up to uh, Paris and uh, was re-proclaimed Emperor of France, or I guess uh, head of France again. So uh, that was pretty pretty badass that he was able to do that. And of course, all the uh, European powers were freaked out by this and immediately declared Napoleon a outlaw and declared war on him, not on France. Because technically France, in their opinion, was still ruled by uh, Louis the Eighteenth, who is who they put in uh, charge after they got rid of Napoleon. So they really just declared war on Napoleon. So uh, Napoleon knew he had to act fast because each uh, European power uh, promised the, each other that they would raise an army of 150,000 men. So he knew he had to haul ass to uh, beat them to it. Because pretty soon he was going to have Russia, Austria, Prussia, and uh, Great Britain uh, pretty uh, much pounding on France's uh, door with uh, shitload of soldiers pretty soon. So uh, he knew he had to act fast and raise his army, which he did. He raised an army of 125,000 men. He was uh, having conscript, conscripts uh, assembled so that pretty soon he would have a couple of hundred thousand men. But his real army at the time was the Army of the North, Army du Nord. And with that army, he set off to uh, invade Belgium because through his scouts and I guess his spy networks, networks he uh, found out that the British army and the Prussian army were separated by, I can't remember the distance, but a pretty good margin, like 30, 40 miles in Belgium, they were separated from each other. So, you know, if he could go up there and split them and keep them divided, that then he could defeat each army in turn. And if he could knock out those two armies, well, then all he would have left to deal with was the Russian army and the Austrian army. So uh, he crossed the border into uh, Belgium and uh, was able to separate the uh, two armies and uh, his plan was at the Battle of Ligny to destroy the Prussian army and at Côte Bras to keep the British army from uh, intervening. He basically gave command of uh, the Battle of Côte Bras to his Marshal Ney, who Napoleon had nicknamed the bravest of the brave during the uh, Russian campaign. And supposedly Ney was the last Frenchman to uh, leave Russia, so that's uh, that's pretty big, uh, pretty badass guy. Um, but Ney was pretty ineffectual during the Waterloo campaign as a whole, and he had a pretty large numerical uh, superiority over the British and uh, their allies. Yeah, basically the British Army, uh, or the Army of the Low Countries as it was called, only of the 120,000 man army, it only had about 30,000 British soldiers. And these were, you know, damn good soldiers, some of the best in the world. I mean, they had kicked the French's asses in the Spain and Portugal for the last, like, 
eight or nine years. So these these guys were tough. Unfortunately for Wellington, the War of 1812 broke out, and so England had to ship a couple of these uh, units off to fight America, in which they did, most famously at the Battle of New Orleans, where they kind of got their asses kicked. So he was missing a few thousand men because of that. The rest of the army was mainly comprised of Belgians, uh, Dutch, Nassau, Brunswickers, you know, not really top of the line. In fact, the Belgians really only spoke French and had fought for Napoleon for a number of years. So Wellington uh, definitely did not trust these uh, soldiers too much. But his British soldiers, he knew, were tough especially the infantry. The cavalry were the freshest cavalry in Europe because you got to remember the French cavalry has been fighting for like 20 years. <laughs> it takes a long time to get to, uh, it takes a long time to train a war horse, you know. So uh, even though the French cavalrymen themselves were, I think, the best and easily most experienced in Europe, uh, their horses, on the other hand, were not that great. So the British definitely had an advantage there. So Wellington, in command of the uh, Army of the Low Countries, was trying to meet up with the Prussians. And uh, Quatre Bras, the reason why it's important is because it's the only road in the area that would let either ar army, any army, go east to west. So it's really... So Napoleon's attacking up the... Uh, Chalawa bustles road which goes south to north and Quatre Bras goes west to east so naturally it's very very important so if uh, Wellington can keep control of Quatre Bras then he can link up with the Prussians so that's why Napoleon sent Marshal Ney to take Quatre Bras so with Ney hopefully holding Quatre Bras then Napoleon can attack the Prussians and destroy them. Now, the Prussian army at this time is really pretty shitty. Most of it's, or I think about one-third of it's made up of uh, Landveer, which is basically uh, militia. So these are like college kids and schoolboys who are like, oh, Napoleon escaped from exile. Let's join the army. They would just put into the Landveer. So uh, these guys weren't going to do a whole lot. And uh, I think the Prussians were also kind of revamping their cavalry and artillery. So this was really, you know, an army that was being remade at the time. And in fact, a lot of uh, Blucher's uh, generals and aide-de-camps and stuff would actually go on to create a very good Prussian army many decades after this. And that army would eventually, you know, be the uh, Prussian army that united Germany and gave birth to the German Empire. So, you know, he had like von Clausewitz and uh, Genesu and all these guys who would go on to be very, very big figures in uh, German military history. But for right now, their army is a piece of shit. So, um, so the Battle of Ligny, which began on June 16th, was a pretty big affair. I mean, it was, I think Napoleon had about 60,000 men. The Prussians about 80,000. And uh, Napoleon's plan was for Ney a couple of miles to the west to take Quatre Bras. And then once he's driven off the British to swing east and come around the Prussian army and to surround it and together destroy the Prussian army. And if they had done that, Wellington would have had no choice but to get the hell out of you know, mainland Europe most likely. Napoleon would have marched north, taken uh, Brussels, the capital of Belgium, maybe even uh, taken uh, the Netherlands, and then, you know, gotten a lot of Belgian and Dutch troops to join his army. They marched south, and to uh, he would have met up with his conscripts and uh, had a decent-sized army, probably well over 300,000 men, to confront the Austrians and the, the Russians. So... It would have been a pretty big deal if he had been able to destroy the Prussian army. But the problems began pretty earnestly, uh, pretty early for Ney. Ney was... The French generals who had had their asses kicked by Wellington in Spain were pretty, pretty wary of him. 
because Wellington would like to, he would, his favorite tactic would be to use a reverse slope, which basically means to find a hill or a ridge and place his soldiers on the other side of it so the uh, army that's attacking can't see the enemy that he's attacking and his artillery therefore can't really do a whole lot. I mean he is, uh, the French howitzers can fire over the hill but that's not as effective as just using, you know, direct fire, just pound the enemy. And I guess I'll talk about artillery for a little bit. Um, basically, the French artillery is made up of 6-pounders and 12-pounders. That's the weight of the rounds used. So basically, picture the 6-pounder firing a 6-pound solid iron ball, the 12-pounder firing a 12-pound iron ball. Now the tactic for uh, using these is to basically bounce the ball into the enemy soldiers. If anyone has, if any of you have seen the movie The Patriot, you kind of know what I'm talking about. You're basically playing uh, bowling with uh, solid iron balls. You're trying to hit the soldiers who, you know, march like bowling pins kind of. You know, you're just trying to knock them over, just tear them to pieces. You know, knock heads off, knock limbs off. Uh, disembowel, go right through them, you know. I think uh, I read in uh, Bernard Cornwell's Waterloo book that uh, one solid cannonball killed like 23 soldiers at the Battle of Waterloo. I guess somebody wrote about seeing a single cannonball do that. Just, you know, one guy after the other, so pretty, uh, pretty rough. And uh, howitzers, much like today, fired exploding shells basically you would put a you'd have a iron uh, hollow iron ball and inside would be a bunch of gunpowder and then you'd stick a fuse in there when you fired it yeah uh, the fuse would ignite and you know slowly burn as the cannonball is flying through the air then when it hits the ground kind of goes nuts sputtering then goes boom sending the outer shell flying everywhere Kind of exactly kind of how uh, grenades work nowadays with fragmentation and stuff. You're just sending the, eye, the outer casing flying everywhere. It's pretty nasty. And uh, for close-up uh, work, you had canister, which was a basically a can filled with musket balls, and it would turn your cannon into a big-ass shotgun. Very nasty. Very effective, too. I mean, you can only imagine having to attack an artillery battery and just having to eat that shit the entire time, the entire way. So just, ugh. you know, you'd lose, I mean, you'd lose on average dozens, if not hundreds of men attacking an artillery battery. So pretty nasty. And a new artillery round developed by the British, uh, invented by a can't remember his rank. I think he was a captain or a lieutenant colonel. Uh, his last name was Shrapnel, which is where we get the word Shrapnel. He invented he invented case shot. Case shot is basically like the uh, howitzer round, the exploding shell, except he filled it with musket balls and the fuse was intentionally designed to explode over soldiers' heads. So that would just litter an entire area with musket balls. And uh, when done right, this was very effective, but you had to have a good guy on the fuse, you know, to cut the fuse to the right length. And uh, that's kind of where that kind of artillery got started, and that's why in World War One they had to bring back metal helmets because shrapnel was exploding over soldiers' heads and just, you know, in the trenches and stuff and just littering them with all that shit, so... That's why they had to bring the helmets back. But they didn't really, uh, case shot wasn't really a big enough issue at this time to necessitate steel helmets, so rock on. So basically you could fire shells over the hill, but that's not going to be as effective. So it was a very ingenious uh, defensive uh, tactic that Wellington used. So Ney was naturally pretty wary of just sending his soldiers over a hill. You know, she don't know what's over that hill. It could be the entire army of the Low Countries. So in the morning of the 16th, Ney had 
Pretty big uh, numerical superiority. He had the second core and uh, the first core. So all together, that's about 40,000 men. The British, who were running to the field, only had about 8,000 uh, men there to start off with. So if Ney had attacked in uh, the morning, he would have taken Quatre Bras and probably would have had enough men to hold it. And then he could have marched east to help Napoleon at Ligny. But he was kind of weary and uh, did not attack in the morning. So that was that was a pretty big blow. And then, uh, I believe before the battle at Quatre Bras began, uh, Napoleon sent orders to uh, the First Corps, which I think was the biggest corps in the French army, to uh, start marching east to get behind the Prussian army. So... The first corps, commanded by De, what was his name, Dolan, I believe, uh, started marching east. So that just cut Ney's army in half. So he wasn't too happy about that. So that was a that was a pretty big f battle that got going. So uh, well, the battlefield of Ligny was kind of weird. A lot of creeks, a lot of brush, a lot of trees, a lot of little villages, and a very very weird battlefield. And uh, before the battle began, Wellington actually rode all the way to the battlefield at Ligny to discuss uh, the plans with uh, Blücher. And uh, Blücher said, hey, can you come to my help? And Wellington said, I, I will if I'm not attacked. And so Wellington rode off west to uh, you know, get ready to try and push Ney away from Quatre Bras so that Wellington could come and help uh, Blücher. But of course, Ney eventually did attack in the afternoon, but that was a little late. But at least it would keep uh, Wellington from coming to Blücher's aid. And uh, Quatre Bras would be a little bit of a bloodbath here and there, back and forth, slug match back and forth here and there. But uh, I think there would only end up being about 8,000 casualties for uh, uh, combined casualties for both sides. So only, I think Ney lost about 4,000 men and uh, Wellington about 4,800. So it wasn't that big of a big of a deal, but it did. Uh, but Ney definitely did succeed in keeping Wellington from coming to Blue Crusade. But you could say the same thing for Wellington, keeping Ney from coming to Napoleon's aid. So it was kind of a kind of a draw, I guess. But um, the Battle of Ligny began at about 2:30 in the afternoon when he heard uh, cannon fire coming from Quatre Bras. Thus, he knew, you know, his left uh, his left flank was in action. So that's when uh, he began his attack with the uh, Fourth Corps under uh, General Girard. And uh, they started off by attacking uh, some of the villages and stuff. And, uh, yeah, it was rough fighting, man. You're having to march an army through brush. And uh, Prussian artillery was uh, hitting the uh, French columns pretty well. But uh, one of the things that Wellington said that morning when he was talking to Blucher, he was looking at the battlefield, and he was like, you know, if you take your Prussian, Prussian soldiers and hide them behind that ridge, they will uh, be pretty well off and pretty well defended against uh, French artillery. And the Prussian and the Blucher kind of looked at him like, bitch, <laughs> please don't tell me what to do. Uh, so Wellington failed in trying to get the Prussians to uh, adopt his reverse slope tactic. So uh, naturally, they, the Prussians were just kind of in the wide open. So the French artillery had a fun time just blowing those guys to hell. So when the French infantry did attack, they were quite successful in pushing the Prussians back. And the Prussians would, counter, would counterattack. And uh, it was just kind of going back and forth here and there. Well, this was okay because Napoleon's strategy was for his left flank, you know, Ney, the first and second corps, to get the job done at Quatre Bras and come over here and surround the Prussians and destroy them. Well, little did Napoleon know was that Ney did not have control of Quatre Bras, and therefore he did not have control of the, you know, west to east road. So. 
Nay would be uh, not really able to, Nay would not really be able to come to his aid with the second corps, but the first corps was able to move a little further east and uh, hop on that road. But the problem with uh, the first corps was uh, when it was in mid-March, and actually Napoleon saw this happen, he saw the first corps coming a couple of miles away, and he was like, all right, you know, we're kind of kicking the Prussians' asses here, but we're not quite able to destroy them. But, okay, the first corps is coming, so all right. But, unfortunately for the French, Ney, when he was engaged with uh, Wellington soldiers, figured that he needed help. So he sent orders to the First Corps, de Hollande, to come to his aid. <laughs> so de Hollande was kind of in a pickle here because he was technically under Ney's command because, you know, they're on the left flank. You know, they're in the west in the West fighting at Croix de Bois, so he was technically under Ney's command, but Napoleon just sent him orders a couple of hours ago to come east, so he's kind of like, eh, what do I do? And unfortunately, he decided to listen to Ney, so he had to turn his, his entire corps of about 17,000, 18,000 soldiers around, <laughs> which you can imagine being strung out over miles, this would take a while. So to Napoleon's absolute horror, I'm sure, he saw the first corps turning around and going west when it was like just a mile or two away from coming around the Prussian army. So naturally he sent orders immediately to Dorlan to, what are you doing? Keep going east. So unfortunately the first corps was strung out, it was turning around, then it just got orders to immediately turn back around. So the first corps ended up not getting engaged at all on the 16th. So it was basically just left in the middle of the two armies not doing anything. So it couldn't help Ney out and it couldn't help Napoleon out. So that was just a huge, huge snafu foobar sandwich. I mean, it was just a nightmare what happened with the first corps. And uh, I absolutely believe if the first corps had, uh, had been able to either knock Wellington off of Croix de Bois, then maybe the first and second corps could have come to Napoleon's aid. Or at the very least, if it had been able to attack the Prussians from the from their right and their rear, I mean, that would have destroyed the Prussian army for the most part. So unfortunately, that didn't happen. And uh, now the Prussians were counterattacking pretty well, and you got to remember, they outnumbered uh, the French here by about 15 to 20,000 men, so this was, you know, kind of serious. But luckily for the French, they had a much better army. So Napoleon had with him the 3rd Corps, the 4th Corps, and his Imperial Guard. Now the Imperial Guard is made up of infantry, mainly made up of infantry and cavalry. You got the Young Guard, who are basically the best soldiers at the time, like the new guys, basically, the best of the new guys. The mill guard are the best of the soldiers from about five to ten years ago. And the old guard, who are the best of the best. I mean, these, some of these guys have been with Napoleon for like 20 years or so. So, I mean, these guys were the best of the best. And then you have the uh, Imperial Guard Heavy Cavalry, which is made up of the Grenadiers, Escheval, De La Garde, and Perial, who were basically Grenadier Heavy Cavalry. And they had never been defeated in battle, just like the Imperial Guard Infantry had never been defeated in battle. And you had the Emperor's Dragoons, who were tough. Well, they're in the Imperial Guard, so they're definitely elite. And then you have the uh, Imperial Guard Light Cavalry, which were made up of the Red and Polish Lancers, and the Invincibles, who were pretty good light cavalry. And uh, I believe it was either the Polish or the Red Lancers also were never defeated in battle. But uh, as far as the Inf Imperial Guard Infantry goes, basically you have Grenadiers and Chasseurs. Grenadiers 
you could tell who they were because they had uh, brass uh, plates on their big bear skin helmets and the shashers didn't. So that was basically the only difference, really, between the two. And uh, the young guard were made up of basically regular line infantry and uh, light infantry. So they were a little more versatile. Basically, the job of the grenadiers and chasseurs were to clearly was to be Napoleon's coup de grace, just the freaking final blow that would destroy an enemy's army, and they had always succeeded at doing that. So, with the first corps out there just floundering around, uh, Napoleon realized that all right, my basically all I can do now is to try and knock out the Prussian army. Can't destroy it, but I can maybe damage it enough to keep them uh, from being a thorn in our side. And uh, the sixth corps near this, uh, I guess this was kind of in the e late afternoon. Uh, the sixth corps was coming up, which was kind of a small corps. I think about six, eight thousand men. So now Napoleon's, you know, getting closer to being even, numerically speaking. So at this time, uh, Napoleon decided to, all right, I'm going to get a, I'm going to move the Imperial Guard artillery up, naturally the best artillery in the world at the time. And uh, we're going to get the old guard supported by the, uh, the Grenadier et Cheval de la Garde Imperial. It's a fun uh, thing to say. You know, and uh, the uh, Grenadier Cavalry of the Imperial Guard had a pretty cool nickname. They were called the Gods. <laughs> so that's pretty cool. So the uh, Old Guard and the Gods got together. And at about 5.45 is when the Imperial Guard artillery opened up on the entire center of the Prussian army. And then with the uh, Gods in support, the uh, Old Guard attacked blew right through the Prussian center, and uh, battle was won. Blücher tried to lead a cavalry counterattack with uh, two brigades of uh, cavalry, and uh, he actually led the charge himself, not too bad for a guy in the 70s back then, <laughs> or even today. But uh, his horse was killed and actually fell on top of him, and he was almost captured by the French. But a major threw his uh, cloak over uh, Blücher, hiding his medals and stuff, and uh, they were able to shuttle him off, uh, sneak him back to the Prussian army. So the Prussian army was definitely broken and in full retreat. But luckily for them, the guy who took over command of the Prussian army decided to retreat northeast, not east. Now, if they had retreated east back to Prussia, that would have been the end. There would have been no way in hell they could have ever come to the aid of Wellington. So, uh, by marching northeast, they were still kind of close enough that maybe in a day or two or three they could come and help. But uh, for right now, the uh, Prussians were in retreat. So, Napoleon had won, but wasn't quite the decisive victory that he had wanted. So, he was pretty pissed off at Ney. In fact, uh, I think he told Ney that you've lost France. Basically saying you've ruined us, you know, by not... One, taking the Croix de Bois, and two, not helping me destroy the Prussians. So that was a thing to say to the bravest of the brave, nay. But with Wellington knowing now that the Prussians were in full retreat, he got the hell out of there. He tried to, he had to keep his army intact to uh, protect Brussels. So he fell back, and that's uh, basically what was going on on the 17th. The next day, he was falling back, and the French were following suit. But one of the mistakes that Napoleon made was he split his army. He gave Marshal Gucci, who was a cavalry commander the previous day, but made a marshal that day. After the Battle of Ligny, he was made a marshal. So he gave Marshal Gucci uh, 30,000 men and told to basically keep the Prussians running. The problem for Gucci was he didn't know where the hell the Prussians were. He didn't know what road they took. They could have gone east. They could have gone north. They could have gone northeast. Could have gone, in, could have gone anywhere. So that was one of his uh, dilemmas. So with that, 
Napoleon only had about 70,000 men left to fight the Army of the Low Countries. But the Army of the Low Countries, after their losses and after being spread out over all over the place, all over Belgium, uh, they only had about 69,000 men ready to fight on the 18th at the Battle of Waterloo. So uh, I guess on the anniversary, uh, on the 200th anniversary of the Battle of Waterloo, I will discuss that battle. But for today, I hope you enjoyed this lead up to it with the 200th anniversary of the Battle of Lini and Quadibois. So uh, take it easy and check out my Waterloo episode on the 18th.